welcome to RDA Tech Q&A. You've got questions, we've got guesses. If you have a tech question you'd like Mike or myself to answer, you can send that to requests at radiodeadair.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line. Mike and I will attempt to muddle our way through something that resembles an answer. Yeah. Um, Sometimes they don't have answers. <laughs> I am Nash. I do Radio Dead Air. I've been doing it for well over, all, oh God, almost two decades now. It, this is 17 years. 17 years of Radio Dead Air. Um, but also I've done a, a, over a decade's worth of tech repair and tech experience. With me as always is my producer, Mike Gearman, who has just as elaborate, extensive knowledge of technology as I do. Which is to Hello. say, we wing it. Um, yeah. But, uh, oh, interesting little week. Interesting little week. Yeah. It from is, a, of course. From a tech perspective, if no other perspective, mm. but there's plenty of other perspectives. Oh, also interesting. and we have a nice little intersection this week. Yes, we do. We have, and this is going to happen. People say, yeah, stop talking about politics. Guess what? The shit's everywhere. Welcome yeah. to real life. Um... This particular intersection of technology and politics is, I never thought I'd have to use Politico as a source for my tech show, but I do. I found, I, mean, yeah. I sent you a wired link, but I found a Politico story that's more updated. In fact, let me give you the okay. updated link right now. Um, this is, re this, okay, so. Uh, the the forty fifth president of the United States has been inaugurated. Yes, I know he sucks. I know forty fifth president of the United States has been inaugurated. He is Donald Trump, and um, how this intersects with technology is Grady. Shut up. Keep your protest to yourself. I swear. No. Grady, you didn't want to go to the march. You're just no. a celebrity. You don't get that opinion on politics. Just shut up and be cute. Stupid celebrity. Um, now, why this intersects with technology is Twitter, which Donald Trump loves to death, but also there is an official sanctioned United States, President of the United States Twitter account. At POTUS. Yes. Now, Which is the acronym for President of the United States, in case in case that wasn't clear to some of you. I, I We have to say that because there'll be someone who goes, why POTUS? The, scrotus is another one, too, that people think we're... <laughs> scrotus, that's not why, but never mind. Um, don't follow Scrotus. Don't follow Scrotus. Uh, the, the President of the United States gets his own Twitter account. Now, up until yesterday... That Twitter account belonged to Barack Obama. His tweets and everything related to his time on that account have been archived at POTUS44. That's because because Barack was also the first president to use Twitter. Yeah, he was. Because um, Twitter wasn't. Was, I don't know. Was Twitter around for Bush? Um, maybe the very tail end. Very the tail end. Speaking of tail ends, get over here, you little loud little monkey. Um. Nash, Nash, I hate to break it to you. That's a cat. Shut up. Um, now, lots of people who are fans and supporters of Barack Obama are not fans and supporters of Donald Trump. Hence, quite, true. quite a number of them unfollowed the POTUS account. Yes. Uh, not, not, not a surprise. And there was a lot of people who probably, on Trump becoming president yesterday, followed, followed it. it. Yeah, yes. some just as many people. Well, I don't know if just, but people followed it. Some people had never followed the account either way. Yes, I'm one of them. I never followed it. Well, some weird shit started happening. Um, and when we say weird shit. We're talking automated weird shit. Half a million people. Oh, God, that face. We're going to have to look at that face. Yeah, I know. Shut up. Half a million people 
We're signed up. Shut. Sit here and shut up. Um, half a million people were signed up to Trump's POTUS uh, Twitter account. Um, it took until Saturday for Jack Dorsey, who is the CEO of Twitter, to admit that yes, five hundred and sixty thousand people were made to follow POTUS Twitter after it was handed over to Donald Trump. Those affected had either opted to unfollow the account while it was still in the hands, uh, or had chosen post inauguration to follow the POTUS 44 account. So, people who actively wanted to follow Barack Obama's POTUS 44 account were being signed over to the POTUS account, and people who had unfollowed the POTUS account were being signed back to the POTUS account. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't an entirely random selection it wasn't like a person who had never followed either certainly right. it or at least not doesn't seem like it well some people claimed otherwise which it, it's hard to verify yeah. that but it is it, it they, they did make those claims you shut up um i'm keeping him here so he'll shut up and he won't be screaming to no you no um now he says, Dorsey said, this was a mistake, it wasn't right, we own it, and we apologize. No excuses. And it's fair, because I'll be honest, in, in my time working with computers, I have seen scripts, which is what this was done. Someone ran a script mm -hmm. uh, that did not do what they thought it would do. We've seen this in real life, we've seen it in movies, we've, I've done it, I ran, I've run scripts that, well, uh, Shit, that crash something. Um, uh, what was that? Um, the Superman movie, Transfer All the Half Cents. <laughs> yes. He put in some programming, ran a script, Transfer All the Half Cents. He didn't think he'd get that much money right up front. He did. Shut up. Um, yeah, the decision was made to duplicate the set of followers accumulated on POTUS during Obama era on the version of the account handed to the incoming Trump administration that had otherwise been scrubbed of tweets. The move was based on the belief that the account, and its base of nearly 14 million followers, was an official government asset properly transferred from one presidential administration to the other. Dorsey said similar issues affected the VP, White House, and press secretary accounts. The problems said the company have been fixed. Okay. The first problem here was going by an assumption of user behavior. Yeah. You tried you tried to predict how users would act with little to no basis on of that prediction. Yeah. If now if it had been for example Joe Biden coming in Hmm. taking over as 45th president. I think it would have been a reasonable assumption, though. Well, most of these people are probably going to want to follow. Well, even even regardless of the politics of it, it's just, from a pure technical perspective, this was a presumption of user behavior, which, if you follow actual Twitter behaviors, I'm not... More random. It is more random, and unfollowing means unfollowing. Now, to be fair, I don't think there's ever been, like you said, uh, Obama was the first president to start using Twitter. I don't think there's been a precedent for this before. Yeah. The, the... Well, and I also think... You got away. Uh, I also think that uh, uh, in, in this case, it was there was probably, because people say they, they, they'd unfollowed it, and they were re-added. Given how Twitter's servers and things work, they're probably re-added from one side of a server, which hadn't finished processing because it takes a while for everything to sync. Uh, saying, oh yeah, we'll pull from this list, which wasn't up to date. Maybe it was up to date from two hours earlier. Because then, I don't know, it happens. Jesus Christ, Grady. He doesn't do this when I'm not on the air. I swear to you, he doesn't. 
just when I'm doing something. Well, guess what? Come here. Come here. Come here. Ah. Come here. Are you going to be quiet? No? Okay. All right. So Fine. What, what does he do when you're not on the air? Does he just walk around and do <sighs> random fat shit? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes he does this, but usually he waits until I'm involved with something else, and then he comes up and just starts screaming. Fuck. Come here. Come here, you Come here. Come here. Come here. You're going out. You're going out. You're going out. You're going out. Say goodbye to Grady, everybody. Bye-bye, Grady. Going out. Bye bye. Bye bye, Grady. Bye bye, Grady. <sighs> we. Yeah. Anyway. Now let's continue. Um, it was, it was just, it was, it, it was a, a, there was a, 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 a logical screw up. And then it looks like there was a computer screw up. You know, the logical screw up was people are going to, people who follow this are going to want to continue to follow this. And then the computer screw up was, you know, some syncing issues most likely. And there was another screw up here. Public relations screw up. Um, they, Twitter is notoriously bad at public relations. Can you think of any big story involving Twitter and a controversy, uh, be it harassment of people, be it um, adding features and forcing people, like moments and all that shit, that Twitter ever got out in front of? Not, not, not one, no. Not what now? Uh, remember a few years back, the Apple and the YouTube bullshit. Yes, absolutely. For those of you who somehow missed this, uh, Apple made a deal with the band YouTube, mm -hmm. and this deal basically said anyone who has uh, an Apple device that was capable of receiving it got a free copy of the YouTube album. It did not matter if you had never listened to you two, you hated the band, you got a copy. And it was not just an email or a notification, hey, you've got a free copy, which, if that's how they'd done it, everyone would have gone like, yeah, what the hell ever. Hmm. No, they actively pushed the U2 album to you, and you couldn't say no. You could delete it off your device, but then it might go, uh, we're going to push it again. Obviously, he didn't mean to delete it. Yeah, so, and the, the thing about Apple was, when that happened, they jumped out right to hell in front of that story. It was a bad story for them. It, it did not look good. The optics, they not good. But they did jump out in front of it. And yeah, that's what they were doing, is they were trying to, to say, hey, we're Apple, we're cool, we're going to give you some free stuff because you bought our stuff. And what I would have done in their situation is instead of just going with you two, is have five or six artists. Yeah. And five or six albums in different genres. So you can get, instead of, and instead of just a push, yeah. it's, here's your notice, you get a free album, pick from these. Yeah, but the point being that Apple was on top of it. Apple is usually on top of their PR issues. Lots of companies are. Google's on top of their PR issues. Microsoft, Facebook, oh God. Facebook will jump if anything even blips. Yes, um, they'll still screw up a lot and go, we're, we're, we've automatically flagged this post as offensive because nine people marked it as offensive because it said bad things about Nazis, so we're going to delete it. Yeah. And then they'll get their shit, they'll get their asses handed to them by nine million people on the internet. But Twitter, on the other hand, it took nearly 24 hours for me to find an official response about this story. I found responses about it on Twitter from Jack's Twitter feed, but a media response. What this allows the the newspapers to do is they get to set the narrative. Yeah. They write the story 
and then they they contact you for comment. If you jump out in front of it, if you issue a press release, if you talk to them first, you guide the focus of how the story yeah. is perceived in the media. And you can say, hey, we screwed up. We didn't get this right. We're sorry. In this case, it's like they've done this horrible thing. Is it a conspiracy? And you you might not see the follow ups. Right. And that that this is PR 101. And I, I don't, can't believe that I know this, and I'm just an idiot on the internet. This is, this is, this is kind of why people are not really interested in buying the Twitter. Yeah. Well, that and they still have their white supremacist issues. Yeah. Well, we go from one issue with social media to another. This is one you all may have been involved with this week, because there's no politics involved. And uh, let me say right now, what we're about to talk about, if you have it on your phone, uninstall it now. Yeah, get this the fuck off your off your phone. Um, lots of you may have seen a meme going around over this past week where uh, involving an app for iPhone and Android called Me Too, spelled M-E-I-T-U. Um, and what it did is it had this nice little filter that could turn you into an anime face and it's, oh, that's neat. I'm going to do it too. And I'm going to post it on Twitter. And yeah, you know, that's not bad. Social media, have fun with your memes. It's cool. Yeah. The problem with this, this app is not yeah. the, the video editing part of it. It's the fact of all the permissions it had and what it was doing with the data. Because your phone, you think, oh yeah, my phone has my contacts. It has some of my email. It has it has my obviously my phone number. It has my address book. Well, it also has a lot more data about you that you don't realize. Yeah, the Me, the Me Too app is sending your IMEI and MAC address and more to a remote service. Now, the first thing you're probably saying is, what do those letters mean? Well, IMEI is the unique identifier that comes with your cell phone. Uh, it's used by cell phone carriers in some cases to activate your phone. Yeah. yeah, and the reason is we say it's unique is because it is a really long number. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's what, 16, 20 something, 24 digits? I don't remember the exact number. It's really long. And uh, I can't remember, can the IMEI have letters in it as well? I don't recall either. It's been so long since I've actually used one. Yeah, so basically what it is, it's this really long number that there are not enough phones in existence for duplicates to have been made. Right. And each phone company basically goes, we're making this many phones. There's probably some central authority between all the phone manufacturers. And they go, I need 100,000 IMEIs. And they go, okay, here's your, here's your block of 100,000 IMEIs. Yeah, and that unique identifier is used to activate your phone, to link to your account. It's what Sprint or Verizon or AT&T, whatever, uses to say, oh, this phone is your phone. It belongs, it belongs to, to this you. person. Um, and it can also be used uh, to remotely deactivate the phone mm -hmm. uh, and, and various other security issues. It can also be used to remotely spoof or duplicate or clone a phone. Yes, because because it's unique, it's supposed to be unique. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you can do with it, if you have someone's IMEI number and the necessary hardware and skill to do it, you can copy their phone. You may not want to make phone calls on their phone, but now you will get maybe their text messages. You can look up their call logs and things like that because mm -hmm. it's being sent to both. The uh, MAC address is the U, not not quite unique, no. but it's the, and the reason I'll say it's not quite unique is, is, the, is the address of your phone for being a computer purposes. It's how they send data to your phone saying, routing through the internet, how it gets there. And it's not quite unique because Top-level stuff is more or less unique, but when, say, Verizon has a set of MAC addresses under it, there might be duplicates somewhere else, but they're on different segments of the network. So as long as when you have your MAC address, the thing you're talking to has its MAC address and has MAC address, MAC address, and as it comes back and chains down, it's unique. Yeah. Um, now, and it also was taking other stuff like local IP. Um, GPS. GPS information. Let's see. It lists, let's see, permissions for uh, all external storage read. Um. Now, some of these apps, some of these permissions you would expect on a right. photo app. 
right. photo modification. For example, it says, hey, I want to be able to use your camera. Well, yeah, that makes sense. So you can take a picture mm -hmm. straight from the app. I need to be able to access the memory card. To write so the photo. save the results. Right. But then it has things like, I want to look at your call logs. I want to be able to make calls for you. I want to I want, con your contact list. I want, and the one that got me, and I still, I've been searching and I haven't found a good answer as to what it is, is modify audio settings. I don't know what this permission does. And I tried searching a Google site and it doesn't give me a lot of... Sounds I, like I, potentially turn on your phone's microphone. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me and I wanted to confirm that. Because if it's if it's like that, then it's sort of like a Cortana style app where it's listening for you to say something to it, or at least potentially. Whether or not that functionality is installed yet or not. Now, the biggest and, problem... Well, let, let me let me go where that is, though. If you have someone's IMEI and GPS, IMEI, you go, okay, with enough time, you can trace this back and go, is this Dave Smith? That's on your end. That is on my end. Okay, so you can say, <laughs> we've got... We we've, we've got the IMEIs of nine thousand Dave Smiths. We've got the GPS. We've filtered it down to the Bay <coughs> Area, mm -hmm. and so we've got three that we're interested in. We've got we've got the fine GPS. We can go. Ah, oh, this is the one we're listening want want to. And now we can listen in on his business meetings. And and the 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 big part about it, the, the nasty part, was all of this information was sent to a remote server. It's being stored somewhere. Not a remote server, like a laundry list of about 14 remote servers. Yeah, it's being sent to it's remote servers with redundancies. Now, even if you argue that the Me Too company is not attempting anything nefarious, that they accidentally overreached and they, they lazily activated all these per permissions they didn't need to, even if you can argue that, the problem exists that a hacker can very easily see what servers all of this data was sent to. They have the address, they can break into those servers, they can take all of that data, and they can go away. And now, they can do horrible things to you. Yes, and one of, one of uh, Me Too got a, a press release that's saying, oh, this stuff, is, it's, it's all encrypted, whatever. Yeah, yeah, Sony thought they were safe too. Just because something is encrypted doesn't mean the person who's breaking in can't find the encryption key or can't get themselves permissions to decrypt. Yeah, it's encryption is not the be all end all. So what this amounts to is if you have this on your phone, get this the fuck off your phone. But sadly, the damage is already done. Yeah, they have your information. They have your IMEI. They are a Chinese company. So they have no obligation to purge it or get rid of it. You fucked, honey. Yeah. Now, apparently the vast majority of this information was gathered when you activated the uh, the functionality uh, that allowed you to do the anime shots. Just the base download did not do it. No. But So if you've installed it, but you haven't played with it yet, you might be okay. Get rid of it. What should you do? There's nothing you can do, I'm sad to say. Yeah. Now, we'll find out in the next few, probably a few months, weeks or months, as to whether or not this is actually an issue. And it may turn out that this is, you know, security paranoia. Yeah. But, but I'll be honest. I'd rather be a little paranoid, more paranoid about security than not. And, you know, we don't get bit in the ass by this. That's fantastic. A good thing to do right now is to keep an eye on your device. Watch for any suspicious activity. Um, also, and I know this is a pain in the ass to do, contact your cell phone or wireless provider and talk to them about adding additional confirmation securities to your account. Uh, verification that only you have some way of making sure someone else can't usurp your account using this information because it has happened before. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's happened to some, you know, rather famous people mm -hmm. on and off Twitter. I mean, there, I, I don't remember who it was, but I think we talked about it. There was a guy on Twitter. A protest activist, yeah. 
I'm not thinking about the protest act. Oh, I'm well. thinking about a computer security guy. Yeah. He had he had one of the very rare, very early Twitter accounts that was three, only yes, three or four yes, seconds yes. long. And he thought, yeah, I'm good. I've got two factor authentication on, on on my account stuff. They still got in. So if you have used this, be very careful. Be very, very careful. Keep an eye on your phone. Keep an eye on uh, who gets called, uh, what gets sent from your phone. Uh, keep an eye on your wireless account. Con- check your bill. Just check- don't just auto pay. Just make sure, you know, if a few cents up, a few cents down, that's standard. If you're suddenly going, where's this extra $5 charge coming from? That one's on my end. That's on your end. Um, what, what happens quite oh. often with people who are doing small scale theft over a wide volume is it's, you know, a dollar mm. here, you might not notice a dollar times a million people. That's some pretty good chance. That's some pretty good money for them. Yeah. Uh, what they will often do is do a, a one dollar charge on, on your account. And if, you call your phone company and protest that. What's this one dollar charge? They can take it off. They don't mess with your account again because they know you're paying attention. You're not worth it. Uh, but if you don't protest and they go, okay, here's the list of people who didn't protest. The next month they'll do a two dollar charge. Yeah. So so contact and a three dollar charge, etc. Contact your wireless provider as soon as possible. If if you use the the Me Too app, I'm very sorry. <sighs> We've got you. It's we're at a point where you can't trust fucking anything anymore. And I'll be honest, if I had the skills, programming skills, to make a replacement app for this that didn't have this crap where so people could have their whatever, I'd make it. I don't have those skills. Well, um, finally in the news tonight, something that's uh, I love when we get these neat little technology things that come up that that actually could be our future. Um, Especially since this is a very uh, Star Trek future. Time. It is. I love this thing. This is neat. Mm-hmm. Currently, our uh, storage media, magnetic base media, and optical media have, well, physics based limits on how fast they can read and write. It's it's just a simple mad matter of the rules that are, govern reality. Yes. But a couple of scientists have come up with a new storage format that, if it's viable in time, could be the fastest media, potentially fastest storage media in existence. Yes. And the best part, it's written in gemstone. And so what this is, it is, uh, it is a this. specific type of, of uh, garnet, which has cobalt seeded through it. And the way they, way they grow these crystals, uh, it's in regular places. So it's not like you've got a chunk of a crystal and all the cobalt at this end because it came out poorly this time. No. No, it's all supposed to be rel- relatively evenly spaced. Mm-hmm. And they hit it with very, very short, so short, I, I, it's hard to describe how short. Femtoseconds. That is, sh- femtoseconds, which are even smaller than nanoseconds. It's it's one of those things where it in and of itself may not be a. It, it's a breakthrough in regard that hey, this is something new. It's neat. It's it's really cool. It may not be something we ever see commercially, but it gives people a direction to look in to do stuff. There is, and this is not, I will note, this is not a long term storage thing here because. Well, so is. you say, they say it lasts a matter of days, but that could just be because they've only recorded it for a matter of days and they can improve oh, yes, yes. the long term of it. But even if it is only a matter of days, this could be a practical replacement for RAM. Yes. Because it is much faster than any current RAM we have. Um, in computers, one of the bottlenecks we have in currently in systems is you have a CPU, which processes information very, very quickly. You have RAM, which is stores information and sends it to the processor, but it can only send it to the processor so quickly. 
And the, so you have this bottleneck where the data is not getting to the processor to be processed fast enough. So the processor is occasionally just sitting there twiddling its thumbs. With this, we could have data that could be read as fast as the processor can read it. Real-time uh, memory for a system. That could be huge. Even if it is only a temporary media st storage media, that could be a tremendous leap forward in how fast computers are. Um, it, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a field where they go, hey, we did this neat thing with these two substances. Garnet doped with cobalt. Yeah. Which will cause some other scientist somewhere reading this paper going, huh, I wonder what happens if you try these other materials. And maybe they come up with one that lasts even longer. Or doesn't require the laser the size of the hard drive. Which, you know, you think the well, laser size of the hard drive is not that big. It, it is when you need like a thousand of them that um, do a memory block. But in, in general, what this could mean is in 10, 20 years, the collected knowledge of humanity could be written in gemstone. And I just find that so... It's really neat. That is so poetic and practical and beautiful. And I fucking love science. I fucking love science. How awesome is that shit? I fucking love science. That is some awesome shit right there. That's amazing. I love that. I love that. You, you know what will still be a problem with it, though? Hmm. You won't be able to keep cat hair off of it. <laughs> Fucking gets everywhere. Fucking gets everywhere. Um. All right. I, I, got, I have to admit, last, well, the last show in, uh, with Tara a couple times, seeing little wisps of cat hair float past your, your camera. Fucking greedy. And entertaining. I've got to keep him, like, vacuum sealed, I think. Okay. Anyway. You don't have to do that. You just have to, just have to brush him. I no. do! I, oh, no, really. fuck that. Anyway. All right. Now it's time to move on to your questions. Uh, questions you have that may, we may be able to assist you with. Um... If you have questions for Mike and myself, tech-related stuff, you can send it to requests at radio.air.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line, and we may be able to help you out with that kind of thing. Let's start off with, and th these, these two are kind of common ones uh, that I hear a lot. First one comes from Natasha. Oh, actually, let's go with Emilio first. Okay. Um, because Natasha is... is uh, not that the question is, uh, if the subject matter is, uh. yeah. Um, Emilio writes, "Hey Nash and Mike, you already spoke quite a bit about putting it on a CPU to improve their cooling, but what about other uh, normal? What about other usually or default heat sink or fan cooled components? The North, if any, or Southbridge chipsets. Useful to put new paste on these, removing the one uh, used when the mobile was made." Or should the thermal conductivity of the whole product differ from one from the one used for the CPU? Also, any useful tips for removing old thermal compound cleanly and effectively? Okay, that, that was a little disjointedly written. What he's asking, what he's asking here is, if you look on the motherboard inside your computer uh, or on your graphics card, you'll notice that there are big chunks of metal that are sometimes with fans, sometimes with fans that are bolted onto it. These are heat sinks. It's not just your CPU that needs to be cooled down to keep it from bursting into flame. Sometimes other components require it as well. Yeah. Most commonly, as we've said through this question, Northbridge, Southbridge, and the graphics. Now, with these components, uh, a heat sink can't just sit on a chip because there are microscopic imperfections yeah. in the metal on the bottom of the heat sink and on the top of the chip. Those have to be filled, else the heat won't transfer properly. That's where thermal pads and thermal compounds come in. They are either this silver goo, what you spurt on the chip. I love saying that because it's true. It's completely te technically accurate. It's this goo you spurt on the chip in very small amounts, squished down, and it fills in those microscopic imperfections in the metal. And allows the heat to more uh, transfer 
much more uh, efficient. Right. Uh, or the other option is what's called a thermal pad, which is supposedly takes on those same properties. It's not nearly as efficient, though. It's it's kind of but it's used... a lot easier to apply. Right. It's easier to apply. It's used in uh, situations where dealing with thermal goo would just be a pain in the ass, especially in mass production. So they just use thermal pads instead. Now, the question here is, should you replace it? Um, if, if you've taken your computer apart to the point where you're pull, pulling heat sinks off these devices, then yes, you should replace the thermal paste or the thermal pad at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to have that inefficiency. But uh, I've never been in a situation where I've been taking the heat sinks off the right. things out. There. Yeah, nor under normal conditions, uh, when you buy a computer or even when you buy a motherboard, you really won't have to bother with the heat sinks on those very often. They usually don't put out enough heat to the point where they're in danger of damaging themselves with the standard thermal compounds on there. Yeah. Um, if they are, it's probably you know days away from your computer just going belly up anyway. If you're overclocking, potentially, but... Even then, you're, more of your heat's coming off the processor than the north and south range. Yeah. Now, uh, there is there are times when if you are, after a while, noticing, if you've had a computer for a while, you're noticing heat problems with it. That may be because, when I talk about spurting the goo, um, when these come from the manufacturer, if you get a pre-built computer or even a pre-built video card, they don't just put a little bit on there just enough to do the job. They slather that crap all over it. They just, they spurt. Uh, Mike, you still there? I'm still there. Oh, you look like you're locked up there. You're just sort of like... No, no sorry. <laughs> they spurt so much goo all over your processor that it doesn't, it stops being a thermal conductor and starts becoming a thermal insulator. That's because they've done it inefficiently. Now, most people working with a computer may not even notice this. But if you start doing hardcore stuff with it, or you start overclocking it, you will definitely notice the thermal compound has been applied incorrectly. In which case, I would, yeah, in that case, if, if you have heat problems, I would recommend taking them off and reapplying them. Yeah, or at um, least taking a look to see if you can see this thermal paste there, and going, okay, yeah, that's possibly the issue. Um, Don't go, oh yes, it must be thermal paste issue. Look first. Look first. Uh, now, as in terms of getting the old stuff off, if you are so inclined, uh, there there is a product made specifically for this. Now, there are other methods you could use. Most of them involve really high isopropyl alcohol, like a ninety percent proof isopropyl seventy or ninety, yeah, seventy percent. But a simple one. And again, I'm not shilling for a company. There, there's no endorsement here. This is just a product I've used because it's fucking easier. A simple way to do it that includes instructions is something called Arcticlean. Yeah, um, it's a good product. It's cheap. It's like I think six bucks for two bottles. At least it was and, back when I've got it. And it was. And I'll say this: it's cheaper than the thermal paste itself. Yeah. Um, one bottle is to actually scrub off or help dissolve the old thermal material. The other is to make sure there are no lingering oils left on it to impede when you put on the new thermal material. Yeah. It's got detailed instructions on how to get the shit off there. It is very helpful. It's the easy and, way of doing it. And I'm going to say something. And the only reason I'm saying this is because I've run into this before. Hmm. And I don't ever want to run into it again. Hmm. You can use paper towels to help clean mm -hmm. off this stuff, and it'll probably be in the instruction there. Use paper towel, right? Or something of that nature. You do not, and should not, ever need to use sandpaper. I've seen sandpaper used for lapping, but that normally is that's a, that's a long involved process to to. To, to improve the finish on a heat sink. That's a long... That's not just scrub um, it once and done. Excuse me. Uh, I never said they used thermal paste or excuse me, the sandpaper on the heat sink. 
They lap their CPU. Yep. Just, just don't waste a bunch of money. Just don't. So yeah, anyway, art to clean, it's the simple way of doing it. I could tell you other materials. Also, Mike mentioned paper towels. Here's a neat trick. Coffee filters are very good, cheap, lint-free cloths. Because that's what you're looking for is lint-free. Right. So um, when I say paper towels, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm coming from a situation where your standard yeah. kitchen paper towel is not something you'd want to use. Yeah. But Because uh, it leaves lots of little, little tiny fragments. Right. Co coffee filters for cleaning off uh, old thermal material is a really good idea because they're, by their nature, lint-free. So, hey. Because you don't want lint in your coffee. Right. And there you go. Or cat fur. Or cat fur. No, you don't want cat fur. Um, I tell you, it's much harder to work on computer stuff with a cat around. I... Uh, all right. Next up is from Natasha. <laughs> Similar uh, question in terms of cleaning. My mother let a good computer sit in the basement, and now it has gotten fairly grimy. I talked her out of using Q-tips to clean the motherboard and insides, and now she wants to know what she should use. Probably she's just get a new computer, but she isn't going to do that either. So to get to the point, what's the safest way to clean inside components of a computer? Oh. oh. Well, okay. So part of it depends on how grimy and nasty it is. Yeah. I have seen situations where the easiest way, and I'm not joking here, to clean the case was to take everything out of the case, including the power supply, take it outside, and hose out the inside. Let it dry for a good day, and then reassemble after cleaning the other components. They do get that bad. It's nasty. All right, let's yeah. let's start. If, with... if you want to see nasty pictures of insides of the computer, there's Google searches for you. Let's start with the basics here. All right, um, we're just going to go back to basics. The first. Good old, reliable, compressed air. Compressed air. Bla take it outside or take it out, uh, preferably onto a screened porch or some other area that is not open to the elements, but it is outside. And blast the fuck out of it. Get every last bit, open it up and get every last bit of dust and movable grime you can out of yeah. there. You may end up needing two or three cans of compressed air. Not just to do to, to to clean the computer, but because compressed air is fun to play with. <laughs> it is a cat toy as well. Oh, Grady hates it. Whenever I hit the button, he runs. He hates yeah. he hates compressed air. Um, um, the second thing I would recommend, they make these. They can be useful. Is little tiny vacuums specifically for computers? Because sometimes what you can't blast out of there, you can sort of. Lightly bristle, you know, the light, light bristles on the little vacuum and shake off that way and suck up. Now, we, we Mike mentioned a specially designed vacuum. You cannot, do not, never use a regular vacuum cleaner on your electronics because... Especially when they're plugged in. Especially when the electronics are plugged in. Or even when they're not, in certain cases, vacuum cleaners are static electricity generators. And a one good low voltage, not enough to make you even jump, not enough to make you realize you've been static shocked, but one tiny little static shock to the wrong component inside your system, and the whole thing's dead. Never use a regular vacuum cleaner on your computer. Use a spe They are specially designed ones for that purpose. Use that instead. Yeah. Now, generally speaking, they're not very big capacity vacuum cleaners. Their little handheld jobs may be about this big. Yeah. So they're used after the compressed air when you want to go. And I primarily use them for effectively the bristle action, just to go, you know, back and forth on stuff, something to go. Compressed air didn't knock that piece of dust ball or whatever that is loose. Let's get the bristles in there and get that out of there. Now, suppose we're in the worst case scenario territory. Ah, sticky grime. If you have uh, grime on the case, now I wouldn't hesitate to do this on any of the physical part of the case. Keep in mind, uh, stay away from like switches, buttons, anything that's uh, open to a circuit. The first step is, we mentioned earlier before, isopropyl 90%, 70 to 90% proof alcohol, rubbing alcohol. Now the reason we got it, it's 70% because proof is double percent. 70%, right. right. Okay, so the reason we say uh, 70 to 90% alcohol is because 
the other percentage of that is usually water. And water is bad for components. But the alcohol evaporates very quickly at that percentage level. So you can clean it off with something and it'll be dry instant later. It might not be the most effective cleaner, but it is the one that is dries the cleanest and leaves no residue. That's yes. the important part. You, you will, don't want to leave, have anything remain wet. You want the least amount of residue possible, which is the, the what the alcohol is for. It doesn't leave any traces that could get onto something and cause a short later on. That's why most electronics, if you have to clean them, that's why they recommend rubbing off. Oh, and by, by the way, uh, we shouldn't have to say this, but it is, is it good. Always unplug everything before cleaning your computer. Yes, don't ever do it when it's plugged in, because that, ne never do that. Never. The only the only thing you can clean with a computer plugged in is if you have the little little removable things over your fans that you can take off and right. knock the, the dust fan. off. Um, now, if we're talking the actual interior circuit boards itself that are covered with grime and other things, this has happened. I have personally seen computers. My worst horror story. I'm going to reiterate, I, I was working for Dell. I was working for Dell on-site repair. Um, this was the warranty people. When, when your computer broke and you lived and, and you wanted someone to come fix it, you didn't know what to do, they'd send me. And I covered a very wide area. Um, I covered uh, Savannah. I covered um, Statesboro, Georgia. I covered all the way down to Brunswick, Georgia. Big, big, Beaufort, South Carolina. Big radius, which were, some were cities. Some of them were out in the country. One of those was out in the country. I went to this house. This man had dogs. The dogs he kept inside. Inside in a kennel. These were hunting dogs. He was not cleaning properly. The air was palpable. It was a physical mask. I had, I, I got the smell all over me. I opened up that computer. Now keep in mind, this is, this computer is in the same house where there is an indoor hunting dog kennel. Which, he, I don't, he was not treating those poor animals well. The inside of that machine, the fans had sucked in so many things, it was just dead. It was, th there was stuff had grown on the circuit boards. It was just, when I left there, I had to tell this poor bastard, um, we we're going to need a whole bunch of parts to replace this. And I didn't even, I, I had to talk to my supervisor about, is this shit covered by warranty? Can we legal, do, do we have to fix this fucking thing? As I was driving away, I had to keep the window down because the smell was still on me. I had to take a bath that night just to try to get this smell off. I only took a shower in the morning. I had to take another one that night just from this smell. I had to soak this crap off of me. Anyway. Did you get sent back? Oh, God, no. I wouldn't go back. It was horrible. Um, I said, no, you go do this when you... I, no, I've done my time. It's your turn. Um, in, the, in whiskey, if you have very bad stuff on the motherboard... You can attempt to clean it. We mentioned coffee filters and uh, high content, 70 to 90 percent rubbing alcohol. Be very careful with this. Make sure it's not plugged in. Double check everything. Clean out all as much as the grime you can physically otherwise first. And even then, you may be looking at a dead computer, depending on how much grime is on these circuit boards, because they can there, be... There could be leads that are connected to each other that aren't supposed to be connected to each other now. There could be leads that have also been corroded just by exposure to nasty stuff. Um, some forms of, of mold and other growths you can get are corrosive to some small degree, enough to eat through metal. Yeah. Um, so that computer may, in fact, be dead. You can, you can try, cross your fingers, give it a shot, have, have a go, maybe, maybe not. And, and maybe let us know how it comes out. Yeah. Good luck to you, Natasha. Hopefully you get this. 
Oh, fuck. Do we want to do the hair puller story? Which one's the hair puller story? How much time do we have left? We have ten minutes. I don't want to get into the hair puller story. Uh, let's let's do Neil's, because okay. I'm just not in the hair puller story. Mood. Save um, that one for next time. Yeah. Oh, God, that, we're, that one's going to take up forever. This one comes to us from Neil. It says, you mentioned that the issue of Internet of Things devices with poor security in the past. I was wondering if Which you is have, basically every Internet of, secure, Inter Inter of Things thing. I was wondering if you have opinions on the measures some companies are actually taking. I recently bought my parents a new 4K TV for Christmas and was surprised to learn it actually has antivirus software built in. Is this an actually viable defense against hackers, or is it just a sandbag wall? Would I be better off not using the smart features? First, congratulations on having the money to buy your parents a 4K TV. Yeah, very Christmas. nice well of done. you. Good boy. Uh, uh, I, I would lean towards more sandbag. Well, sandbag wall is actually very effective for what they're doing in the real world. Um, but I would, I would be wary of trust. It could be good antivirus. My problem with antivirus on an inter Internet of Things device is every Internet of Things device, be it a light bulb or a TV, has a finite amount of memory. Mm -hmm. And in that finite amount of memory, say you put antivirus in there, you've got to also have antivirus definitions. Mm -hmm. Which have to be updated. Antivirus definition updates are fairly small. And they continue to grow. And sometimes they're not free. And so what you have effectively is, I mean, I, I, I meant to look up, the one thing I forgot to do was how big is my definitions file on my computer? I suspect it's quite large. And it Comparatively is, speaking to your standard memory, you might have an Internet of Things device. Now, if this is, if this is a 4K TV, say with built-in massive memory so we can record movies for you, then it probably has enough room for those definitions you'll just slowly lose ability to record as much TV as you used to. In this case, um, I believe, are they using Android-based? I think it's Android TV-based. In this case, when it comes to Internet of Things and security issues, antivirus, viruses are not the problem. Viruses are not the concern. Viruses are not... So this is a bit of a fig leaf in terms of actual security. Viruses are not the problem with Internet of Things devices. What the problem is, is they're not secured properly. They use default passwords for login. Um, they don't have proper encryption on how to access them from outside the network. They are not... Well, the, the, you know, it could be a virus itself let someone in to get to do those things easier than manually easier but in some cases it's just very bad security that wouldn't even require a virus to penetrate yeah and, and keeping in mind um virus writers tend to go for low-hanging fruit right the reason there were no mac viruses for the longest time is because there weren't enough macs out there to make it worthwhile to write a virus for <laughs> yeah the reason you don't see uh, Amiga viruses out there is because ain't nobody got Amigas anymore. Not except for those those old diehard obsessives. They're they're like the vinyl obsessives of computers. Amiga users, they're like the hipsters who only listen to music uh, through tube amplified stereophonic systems. You can hear the actual sounds that you can't really hear. Yeah, that that's that's a me users. Um, but yeah, that sort of thing. So uh, I'd be more impressed if it say said came with a firewall or if it had security settings on mm -hmm. there. If if I've not seen the seven series TVs, so if you can go in there and change the default password, that right there is significantly more security than your standard Internet of Things. Or device. or and I'm not just we're not talking about change the passwords on the parental controls. We're talking change the passwords on accessing uh, the, the settings, accessing the nuts and bolts of it, being able to make administrator and guest accounts, stuff like that. Having account control, having control over the device in a fundamental way. Yeah. For example, if you could lock it down so it could only talk to your lo the, the local router. Right. It 
can't talk. Yeah, if if you wanted to, that it can't receive incoming wireless like local Wi-Fi signals and whatnot. It can only talk to the right. You can if that would be security. But a virus scanner is not really the type of Internet of Things issue that's affecting. Them. Yeah. Now it might become one in the near in, in the future, right. uh, near or far. But right now it's 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 more. Hey, there's all these devices. It's it's Internet of Things devices are where Wi-Fi in general was seven years ago, when you could drive around a neighborhood and you could tell who had Wi-Fi because ain't nobody was securing anything, and you could war drive around. Did you did you ever read World War Z? No, I didn't. There's a. Wh- I'm not a big fan of zombies. World War Z is a fantastic book, and if you haven't read, it, especially the audio book, you should. There's a part in uh, World War Z where a crafty businessman, I say crafty, he's really more of a sociopath, um, markets a rabies vaccine uh, and calls it phalanx and pretends like it influences the, he says, hey, it's a rabies vaccine. We're calling this virus African rabies. I made a rabies vaccine. It, It protects you against rabies. He markets it in such a way as to give the impression that it would prevent the zombie virus. It did not. That's what this makes me think about. This virus protect, this virus, antivirus thing. We have antivirus protection. It ain't doing shit against the Internet of Things issues. That's not the issue. The, the Marketing it that way, if they are indeed marketing that way, is disingenuous and glosses over the real issue with the Internet of Things security. Which also involves zombies, because that can turn your computer into a zombie botnet, which starts DDoSing everything, and the entire internet crashes. I'm not exaggerating. That's what could potentially happen, unless we crack down on real security for Internet of Things devices. Viruses ain't the problem just yet. Yeah. All right, well, that's going to do it for us this week. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we'll be back in two weeks. If you have questions, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. Mike and myself will attempt to answer them for Mike and myself. Mike myself and Mike. Uh, we'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. I don't.